I unapologetically embrace the view that to some degree insulin resistance is a common root cause for most chronic diseases. Obviously type 2 diabetes, yeah. obesity is in there. Alzheimer's, fatty liver disease, infertility. So why is that? Insulin is one of the few peptide hormones that will literally affect every single cell of the body. For example, the connection between insulin resistance and breast and prostate cancers. I'm not saying insulin resistance is the singular contributor, not at all, but it is absolutely a contributor. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm very excited to be sitting here with Dr. Ben Bickman, who is a professor of cell biology at Brigham Young University. A lot of people that have normal blood glucose levels, mm -hmm. quote unquote, mm -hmm. can actually be insulin resistant. Right. Why is that? And what what is this state of like pre-pre-diabetes mm -hmm. and why is it something that is not caught sooner? Yeah, yeah, and yet so common, right? I mean, that that adds an extra layer of reason to talk about this because it is, it's become the most common problem. People, much of modern clinical care has what I call a glucose-centric paradigm when it comes to monitoring metabolic health or even cardiometabolic health, given how relevant diabetes and metabolic problems are to cardiovascular disease. But the the consequence of the glucose-centric paradigm, and there's reasons for it, so I don't mean to to state this in any kind of incriminating way, they, they have their own justification for the glucose-centric paradigm, but it's increasingly harder to overlook because of what we know with regards to insulin. So insulin resistance is the state where Insulin levels are higher. The body's having to use more and more insulin in order to keep glucose in, in check. Uh, but because it is able to keep glucose at that normal range, it flies under the clinical radar because of our glucose-centric paradigm. The, the conventional clinician is only measuring glucose every time the patient's coming in for an annual visit with no regard uh, to the patient's insulin levels. If we were able to broaden the paradigm a little bit and include insulin, then all of a sudden we are measuring the earliest signs of insulin resistance because it is insulin itself that ought to be measured when we're trying to get that view of the patient's not only metabolic health, but insulin resistance. So to state all that another way, type 2 diabetes is when both insulin is high, but it's starting to really lose the war. And now glucose rises as well. Then the conventionally trained clinician says, ah, oh, the glucose is elevated, so you have diabetes or prediabetes. But in its earliest stages, the glucose is still normal, but there's this cold war happening in the body where the insulin levels are still two or three or four times higher than they used to be. It needs to be that high, but and it's working well enough to keep the glucose in check. And so the glucose-centric paradigm has, a, has us miss the earliest metabolic canary in the coal mine, which is insulin. So the sooner our paradigm with modern medicine includes insulin, then the earlier we can detect these metabolic problems in a person who's progressing towards type 2 diabetes. But also, it changes the treatment protocol too, because not to go off on a tangent too soon off the very first question here, but... If the longer we ignore the insulin, the more the clinician may be tempted to push the insulin up even higher by giving, say, a type 2 diabetic an insulin therapy. Now they're pushing the insulin from high to super physiological, all in an effort to control the glucose, little realizing that in the process you're actually killing them faster because so much of what kills the type 2 diabetic is not the hyperglycemia. It's the, in, the hyperinsulinemia and the insulin resistance. In this world we live in now where glu continuous glucose monitors are so becoming very popular, mm -hmm. many people have them without a prescription, you can get them. Yep. Is there any signs or tests using those that people can do to kind of look for this potential problem with, you know, having perhaps high insulin. Yeah. In fact, they're not measuring insulin, but glucose. Yeah, right. Yeah. So to answer the first uh, the question very directly, I'm an enormous advocate of CGM use. The more we democratize access to CGMs, I think the better we put individuals in a position to be their own coach. You know, they don't need to have someone like me or you 
berating them and telling them to change their habits and eat a little better, when you see how your body's responding to what you're eating and the CGM enables that, you end up making your own lifestyle changes. So with the, with the use of the CGM, fasting glucose isn't going to be the best indicator. It's going to be the dynamic glucose. So if you've eaten a carbohydrate heavy meal or, or a simple carbohydrate, I shouldn't call it a big meal, but a simple carbohydrate like two pieces of bread, if your glucose levels aren't back down to normal by about two hours, that suggests a problem. So in my mind, the greatest utility of the CGM is to monitor the dynamic changes rather than the static where am I at every morning. That has less value. The dynamic changes are what has value. But beyond the use of the CGM, if a person's curious about their insulin resistance, in many instances, you don't even need to get a blood test. The, the skin is a window to the metabolic soul where if a, there are two things you can observe just on your skin, and they're both generally going to be right around the neck. One of them is a, a condition called acanthosis nigricans, which is when around a, the little skin fold that most people have around their neck, the skin will get darker pigmented which can be harder to tell depending on the pigment of the person's skin. But what is obvious regardless of pigment is the kind of crinkled tissue paper texture of the skin. So the skin will be very sort of roughed like crinkled tissue paper. So that's acanthosis nigricans around the neck. And then the other one people know is called skin tags. And that is those little, it's not like a rounded little mole, but rather a distinct little kind of mushroom stalk column of skin. People probably know what I'm talking about. You can see them around the neck. Sometimes you can see them around the armpits. But again, it's just a teeny little, like a little mushroom stalk almost of skin, skin tags. Both of those are very, very strong evidence of insulin resistance. And the nice thing is, as the insulin sensitivity improves, those problems go away, just like everything else will.